All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Daily Power Parsha, a.k.a. DPP. Just got to get our acronyms uh, correct so we know what we're talking about. All right, this is our daily look at the Torah portion. Today is Friday, July 8th, 2022, and thus we are going to study the grand finale of the Torah portion of Chukat, namely readings number six and seven. So reading Shishi and Shvi of the Torah portion of Chukat or Chukas is on the slate for today. So just a quick recap. This week's Torah portion is absolutely just out of control, amazing with ideas and drama and narrative and story and game-changing experiences. And some great and some really not great. All right, so just a quick recap before we get into the final stretch of, of the Torah portion. So we began the week with the Chok of Al Chukim with the most super rational decree out there, the red heifer. Somebody becomes uh, impure, ritually, spiritually impure, coming into contact with a dead body. So the only way out of that, you can go to mikvah for today, from today to tomorrow, it's not going to help. The only way out of that impurity is through the ashes of the red heifer. You take a red heifer and you prepare, you sl slaughter it, you sprinkle the blood, you burn it with other things, take the ashes, put it into a vessel, earthenware vessel containing fresh spring water. And then on the third and seventh day after the contact with the dead, it is sprinkled and applied to the individual. And then on the seventh day, they become purified. That's how we began the Torah portion. Then we got into the passing of Miriam. Miriam from the, I call them the royal family, right? Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Miriam passes away. And immediately the water supply stops because the well of water that miraculously rolled with the Jewish people was in her merit. No more well, no more Miriam, no more well. The people complained. Moses turned to God. God said, speak to the rock. Moses hit the rock. Water came out. God said, you didn't do the right thing for various reasons. As the commentators discuss, you're not going into the land, nor will Aaron go into the land either. Then the next narrative was the Jewish people trying to advance to the land of Israel, final approach through the land of Edom. And the Edomite king says, no passing through us. The Jewish people walk around teaching us the lesson, not every confrontation needs to be fought. They then traveled to a place called Har Hahar, and that is where, and that is where, um, Aaron dies. So Miriam dies in this week's Torah portion, and Aaron dies. He goes on the mountain, takes off his high priest clothes, dresses his son, Elazar, who becomes the next high priest, and he passes away. Aaron does on top of the mountain, and everyone mourns him for 30 days, both the men and the women, because of his um, commitment to peace amongst the community. The next thing was Amalek wages war, hearing that the clouds of glory the clouds of glory signifying God's special love for the Jewish people had dissipated after Aaron's passing. The clouds of glory dissipate, Amalek attacks, attacks, and they take a captive. What happens is um, the people um, pray to God, and indeed God delivers them, and they are successful in the battle against Amalek. Well, then they're traveling around Edom, and the travel is long, and the people think, once again, they are not getting anywhere, and they're being taken on a roundabout, maybe maybe another 40-year journey. They fear the worst. They begin complaining. God sends snakes, poisonous, venomous snakes, to attack the people. The people are attacked. People are dying. Moses uh, turns to God. God says, create a snake, put it on a pole, and it was manufactured a snake, not a real snake, obviously create a, a sculpture of a snake, put it on a pole, hold it up high. People will look at the snake, they'll be healed. That was the end of yesterday's session. I explained that it's not the snake that heals, it's God that heals. They were looking up to see God, looking up past the snake. Why looking at the snake? To recognize that the source of the trauma, the source of the tragedy actually holds some blessing in, 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 um, in, it, uh, in and of itself. There was there's something positive that comes through, that can come through the trauma, through the pain, and that really is the only justification for pain in general. The only justification is if we come out of that experience stronger, better, uh, more wise, whatever it is. If it's, just, if it's just something that knocked us down, 
And that seems like a, like a tragedy, like a tragedy, like a real tragedy. So the, the goal is not to get knocked down. The goal is to learn something from that experience. I mentioned at the end of yesterday's session, Jacob wrestles with the angel. The angel hits him in the leg. And you would think when the angel says, let me go, I'm done. Jacob would have said, good, get out of my life. No, he holds on to him and he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. It was the source of the pain can be a blessing. And we ought to seek out the blessing in that source of pain to transform it from a holy negative to something negative that also contained some level of positivity. No one else can do that for anyone else. And it would be, frankly, uh, um, insensitive for any one person to tell someone else, here's the lesson that you need to learn from your pain, right? Uh, this is why it happened. This is, sorry, Ray, go ahead. Uh, is this where Jacob's name becomes Yaakov or no? Yisrael, yeah. That's where his name becomes Yisrael. He Sorry. says, bless me. And he says, what's your name? Hey, Jacob. It's now Israel, Yisrael. Right, Yaakov, Yisrael. So he does get a blessing. But that, that language that Jacob uses, that Yaakov uses, I will not let you go until you bless me. That is that is the commitment to finding whatever silver lining. And again, I was just mentioning, it's insensitive for anyone to tell anyone else, oh, you know why that happened to you? Yeah, that's not I, I, that that's no one else has that job except for the person themselves and it's not a job it's an opportunity point is it's an opportunity the opportunity to find some measure of healing some measure of not just consolation but real real healing some measure of growth in the pain which then lends it a much deeper purpose than just something that was for the sake of pain alone I, i'm sure everyone i'm sure all of us can relate to that in other words, the idea that having gone through something difficult, we didn't have a choice going through something difficult, right? We went, something difficult happened, to, something painful happened to us. When we experience that, ultimately, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but ultimately when we experience that as somehow a growth experience, that is finding something positive. That is leveraging the pain for something beneficial as opposed to it being a, 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 a holy dark or painful experience, which again, no, there's no there's no judgment and there's no blame, but that certainly uh, certainly would be preferred if we could find some measure of growth. The Jewish people are bitten by snakes. It's by looking at the snake that the lesson and the growth and the healing happens. Okay, now we're primed. I just I, I felt like doing a recap because it was such a again such a rich Torah portion. Now we're ready to jump in to reading number six. Okay, here we go. The journey continues. The journey. The final march to Israel continues. Numbers chapter 21, the children of Israel journeyed on and camped in Obot. In the Hebrew, it's, yeah, Obot. They journeyed from Obot and they camped in the wasteland passes in the wilderness, which faced Moab toward the rising sun. So poetic, so poetic. The wasteland passes in the wilderness toward the rising sun. Beautiful. From there, they journeyed and they encamped along the stream of Zered. From there, they journeyed. We're going, this is the, the, the final approach to Israel. So we're getting all the stops along the way here. From there, they journeyed and they encamped on the other side of the Arnon, which was in the desert, extending from the Amorite border. For Arnon was the Moabite border between Moab and the Amorites, right? It's the Amorite border. Okay. It's a, uh, a stream. A stream. The Arnon was a stream or a river, a small river. Concerning this, it is told in the account of the wars of the Lord, what he gave at the Sea of Reeds and the streams of Arnon. Huh, very puzzling, very cryptic. What's going on here? Somehow the Torah is comparing, comparing what happened at the Sea of Reeds to what happened at the streams of Arnon. Very puzzling because the Torah doesn't really tell us what happened at the streams of Arnon. It just says that they journeyed and they encamped on the other side of the Arnon. Um, what does that mean? What happened at the streams of Arnon? Don't worry, I'm going to explain. And the spilling of the streams that turned to settle at Ar and lean toward the border of Moab. Hmm, what does that mean? From there to the well, that is the well of which the Lord said to Moses, gather the people and I will give them water. Something happened at the streams of Arnon that the streams moved and they merged and then they came to the well, the well of water that God told Moses, I will give them water, i.e. the well that was produced from the hitting of the rock. Then Israel sang this song 
ascend, oh well, sing to it. They sing a song to this water that now merged with the well. A well dug by princes, carved out by nobles of the people, through their lawgiver, with their staffs, and from the desert, a gift, very poetic. This is a very poetic song. But what does it mean? I'm going to explain. From the gift to the streams, and from the streams to the heights, from the heights to the valley in the field of Moab, at the top of the peak that overlooks the wastelands, and you and I would be forgiven for scratching our heads at this entire reading and saying, I have no idea what just happened. We have verse 10 through 20. We have 10 verses. And honestly, you and I would be very much forgiven and it would be very uh, reasonable to say, I have no idea what just happened. We're reading about the Jewish journey throughout the desert. They're going from one place to another place to another place, streams of Arnon, and then everything goes, goes strange. Weirdly poetic. We're talking about you know, uh, um, um, singing songs about wells and and giving thanks and comparing it to the sea of uh, the red, the, sea, the splitting of the sea of reeds. What what is what is happening here? So I need to tell you the big the big idea. There was something that happened to the Jewish people by the streams of Arnon that was one of the greatest miracles in Jewish history. One of the greatest miracles. And the Torah doesn't say it clearly. Now, how do, so how do we know it? Well, we know it because it's our story. It's our nation's story. The story has been packed. The story was experienced by a few million people. And then it was told from parent to child. And the Torah has the poetic version of it. But we know the story. So what happened? Rashi will explain to us. Rashi will describe what, and Rashi didn't make it up. He's getting it from Medrash, which is the account of the, of the tradition. Rashi explains just exactly what happened with this great miracle. And trust me, it is absolutely stunning, this miracle. Let's go back inside. Let's look at the Rashis. Let's go al Haseder. Let's go in order over here. Okay. Um, let's do this here. They traveled... Um, they, uh, they, tra they encamped on the other side of the Arnon, Arnon River, which was in the desert, extending from the Amorite border. Rashi says the boundary at the edge of their territory, yeah, i.e. border. Um, the other side of the Arnon, they circled the southern and eastern sides of the land of Moab until they came to the other side of the Arnon River in the middle of the Amorite territory to the north of the land of Moab. So if you picture Moab right here, so they went south and east of Moab, so they came to the other side of the Arnon River, which was to the north of the land of Moab. So I guess they circled like this, okay? Extending from the Amorite border, a strip of Amorite territory protrudes from the Amorite border into Moabite territory, reaching until Arnon, which is the Moabite border. The Israelites camped there. I mean, look, honestly, really help if you had a map. The Israelites camped there without entering the border of Moab, for Arnon was, in the, was the Moabite border, and they did not allow them to pass through the land. Even though Moses did not state this explicitly, uh, Yiftach did explain it, as Yiftach said, also to the king of Moab, he sent, but he was unwilling in the book of Judges. Basically, the Jewish people asked all of the nations bordering Israel to enter through their land and go into Israel, and all of them said no. no. We read about Edom, the same thing as true with Moab, the same thing as true with Ammon, the same thing as true with Midian. All of the nations did not permit the Jewish people to go through. Um, Ray, did you want to jump in? No, it's okay. You, you covered it. Thank you. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, Moses, however, alludes to it, just as the children of, of Esau, who dwell in Seir, and the Moabites who dwell in Ar, did for me. He compares Esau, the Edomites, to Moabites, just as these, the children of Esau, the Edomites, did not permit them to pass through the lands, uh, but they circled around them, so did Moab do. All right, now, now, okay, all of that is the, is the background about their journeys. Again, they kind of looped around Israel, and not only looped around the borders of Israel itself, they looped around the lands, the nations that were bordering Israel as well, because they did not let them through. All right, but the bottom line is that something happened at this encamping, encampment that was miraculous. Listen to this. Concerning this, it is told, concerning this encampment and the miracles that happened there, it is told in the account of the words of the Lord when they relate the miracles that happened to our forefathers, they will relate what he gave, etc. In other words, in the annals of history, when we talk about the great miracles that happened to the Jewish people, this will show up. This will show up in those books, in those accounts of the miracles. Um, just as we recount the miracles of the Red Sea, 
so should we recount the miracles that happened at the streams of Arnon. For here too, many great miracles were performed. What were these great miracles? All right, here we go. Buckle up, my friends. Buckle up. The spilling of the streams. Don't worry, we haven't said it yet. We're going we're gonna to get there. The Aramaic translating of, shef, uh, of shef, shef, Shefech, spilling, is, ah, is Eshed, the spilling of the streams. For there, listen to this, the blood of the Amorites who were hidden there were spilled. In other words, there was an enemy lying in wait, and they were taken out before they could cause harm to the Jewish people. And that's the blood that was spilled that then merged with the streams and the rivers and then merged with the fresh water. Listen to this story as Rashi continues. The mountains were high and the gorge deep and narrow. I want you to picture for a moment, picture a path with mountains on either side. Picture, I, I picture like a Grand Canyon, I don't know, like Arizona, like that type of area, you know, like red, everything's red and orange and beautiful and gorgeous. And I picture like a mountain on one side and a mountain on the other side and a narrow gorge, deep and narrow gorge in the middle. The mountains were so close to each other, Rashi says, that a man standing on the mountain on one side of the gorge could speak to his fellow standing on the mountain on the other side. If you, the gorge was so narrow. Sometimes you see nowadays people fly drones or even wingsuits in between these types of narrow gorges between these mountains, very skilled individuals, certainly with the wingsuit, or very uh, brave individuals. Um, you could speak, could have a conversation from one mountain to the other, because the space in between was so narrow. Think of buildings in Manhattan, right? Let's continue. A road passed along the floor of the gorge. And the Jewish people, let me fill in some information, were, go, were passing through, going to be passing through that road that was in the gorge. So they were going to pass through this very narrow path between these very tall mountains. So the Amorites said, Amorites are the Emory. Not Emory, that's, that's uh, someone else. The Amorites said, when the Israelites enter the land by passing through the gorge, we will come out of the caves in the mountains above them and kill them with arrows and stones shot from catapults. They were lying in wait in caves on top of the mountain or in the mountain. And as the Jews were going to pass through, they would be sitting ducks with nowhere to go, nowhere to escape. It was a flawless plan, and I can't help but think of the tragedy that happened just a few days ago in Chicago, and how an individual went up to a rooftop and opened fire on innocent individuals with no, with, with, with I mean, there was a place to run eventually, but, but, you know, unexpectedly, this, the Amorites were looking to do this. They were looking to take out the Jewish nation from the top of the mountain as they were passing through, through various weaponry. However, listen to what happened next. There were clefts in the rock on the Moabite side of the canyon, and directly opposite those clefts on the mountain of the Amorite side, there were protrusions appearing like horns and breasts, basically. There were, there were caves on one side and protrusions on the other side. When the Israelites prepared to pass through, the mountain of the land of Israel trembled, like a maidservant going out to greet her mistress, I guess somebody who's like really, you know, <laughs> attentive and, and, and on the run and moved, listen to this, the two mountain ranges moved toward each other. So one moved toward the other. The one on the Amorite side moved toward the mountain of Moab. Then those breastplate protrusions entered the clefts, killing them, the Amorites. The individuals, the Amorites that were hiding in the caves were killed by the protrusions that came from the other side when the two mountains smashed together. This is the meaning of that turn to settle at R. The mountain swung from its place and moved toward the side of the Moabite border and attached itself to it. Thus, it leaned on the border of Moab. That is all from the Midrash. Various, uh, various sources, Tanchuma, uh, as well as, um, as, well as Bamidbar Rabbah, Numbers Rabbah, chapter 19. Bottom line is that this... this, this um, the Amori, the Amorite, the Amorites were about to launch an unprovoked sneak attack 
devastating, God forbid if it was successful, devastating attack on the Jewish people. And a miracle happened before, listen to this, before the Jewish people got there, before they entered the, the, the road that was at the bottom of that gorge in between those two mountains, the mountains already smushed together, smashed together. The enemy was killed. There were so many enemies that the blood literally, literally flowed down the mountain and into the water streams. Let's continue. From there to the well. From there, the flow of blood, as I just mentioned, came to the well. How? The Holy One, blessed be he said, who will inform my children of these, mir of these miracles? In other words, how will the Jewish people know that there was ever an enemy who was a mortal threat to their existence and that God took out the enemy for them to, to, be, to, to survive? How will they know that if the enemy was taken out in such a seamless behind-the-scenes fashion? The proverb goes, if you give a child bread, inform his mother. At least get some credit for it. After they pass through, so what happened was the mountains returned to their places and the well descended into the stream and brought up the blood of the slain, their arms, their limbs, and carried them around the camp. The Israelites saw them and sang a song. Basically, the mountains crushed together, crushed the Amorites. Then the mountains pulled apart. And at that point, the blood, and it's, it's a bit gross, I know, it's lunchtime now and we're reading about this, but it is what it is, the blood of the slain, their arms, their limbs, they were all carried around in the stream that obviously became a stream of blood that then entered the, the, other, the, other, um, uh, the other water sources. Um, what they did about water and blood and, and all that stuff and all that gore, that's for another time, for another conversation. And frankly, I don't really know exactly how that played out. But the point is, that this great miracle happened even before the Jewish people got there. They never faced an actual, um, uh, um, a, a, an active threat. The threat was taken out before it could become an active threat. So then Israel sang this song, Ascend, O Well, sing to it, Ascend, O Well, from the stream and bring up what you are to bring up. Hi, Sarah, welcome. How do we know that the well informed them? For it says from there, the well. Hey, Mark. Welcome. Hi. Good to see you. Was it really from there? Was not the well with them since the beginning of the 40 years? However, it descended to proclaim the miracle. Similarly, then Israel sang the song, was said at the end of 40 years, but the well was given to them at the beginning of 40 years. Why was this song written here instead of earlier? Because the subject of the song explained the connection to what precedes it is in the um, because the subject of the song is explained the connect in connection to what precedes it in the above text. In other words, the song that they sang, Ascend, O Well, is not for the water that they had all 40 years, because why wait to the end of the 40 years? It's specifically to the fact that God had taken out the enemy, the Amorite enemy, before the Jews even got there. And, 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 and the proof of that was carried around by the well water, carrying the blood and the, the limbs and the arms, et cetera, of the enemy. And thus they, they, they thank God and they spoke and they sang about the well, not just for the well, because they had water for all this time, but for this great miracle that happened um, in this context. The well was dug out by princes, Moses and Aaron, with their staffs, right, upon which the explicit name was engraved. From the desert, given to them as a gift. From the gift of the streams, the Targum and resistance was given to them and descended with them to the streams. Okay, so, so what we have here, just to um, recap, before we get into verse 20 in Rashi, uh, in verse 20, um, it talks about Moses and other stuff. So let's just recap quickly this great miracle. Um, the, the Jewish people are, are on the final march to Israel. The enemy is lying in wait and God takes out the enemy. And this teaches us, we'll, we'll launch into a lesson right away. This teaches us a powerful lesson. We don't know, and there's really no way to know how many miracles God does for us in our everyday life. Who knows what danger could have come upon us that was averted because of God's intervention. Just like the Jewish people who were in a very, very threatening or threatened and precarious position. And then God alleviated that threat without them even knowing. It was only later that God revealed to them what he had done. But as it was happening, as it went down, the Jews had no idea that this was even a danger. How powerful it is to think about how this is the story of our lives. How when we walk on the ground, literally on the earth itself, and the earth is solid and our footing is solid and we drive to work and everything is fine and everything works out, how many miracles, how much divine intervention, how much blessings, how many blessings we are the recipients of to ensure our safe passage. We take our safety for granted. We take our health for granted. We take our blessings for granted. It's one of the great 
it's one of the great um, what's it called? tragedies. I don't know if it's a tragedy. It's one of the great um, liabilities of the human condition. That is that we very rarely, we very rarely appreciate things when everything goes smoothly. Very rarely. We take it for granted. Of course it went smoothly. How well should it go? <laughs> of course. We have expectations that everything should go smoothly. Right? If we, if we took it from the other perspective, zero expectations, something works out, even the most ordinary thing, Baruch Hashem, thank God for the blessings. We would be living a life filled with gratitude. You know, Judaism encourages us to do this. We wake up in the morning and we're alive. The first thing we say, thank God. Thank you. Thank you for life. It's a powerful acknowledgement. It means that we don't take our next breath or our first breath for granted. We don't take the fact that we woke up for granted. Person might say, of course I woke up. What else should happen? What else should happen? Do we need to go into what, what else could happen? You woke up. Don't take it for granted. It's a blessing. You, you, you were able to get dressed in the morning. Don't take it for granted. You had food. You have food in your house to eat. Don't take it for granted. We say blessings over all these things, over the ability to get dressed, the ability to stand up, the ability to walk. It's the morning blessings. The food that we have, every single thing that we eat, we say a blessing. We don't take Judaism. The goal is not to take anything for granted. Everything is a blessing. Our culture, you know, the more we have, the more we expect. And expectations are a very tricky thing because once you have that expectation, it can never cause you happiness again. The only thing it can cause is consternation and disappointment. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. Suddenly, something out of reach, something that might be otherwise considered a luxury, now comes into reach. Now you have it. This thing was a dream of yours, and now you have it. Great. And you're very excited. I oh, can't believe it. How about tomorrow? How about tomorrow? Now you expect it. Of course. It's mine. I expect it. It no longer sparks joy. It can't because it's yours. It's an expectation. The only possibility that this thing can do is cause disappointment when it's not there. When it's there, yeah, of course. When it's not there, how dare you? My life is terrible. My life is ruined. You understand this? The more we get, the more we're primed for disappointment, not joy. It's crazy. It's like the inverse. It's the inverse effect. The joy comes, the, the way we typically experience joy in 2022 Western society, at least in the United States of America, the way we experience joy is the anticipation and the desire for something we don't yet have. But having it, having it by and large does not itself spark, spark joy because it, it, it quickly moves from joy to expectation. Expectations do not elicit joy. Expectations are expected. Of course, of course I'm supposed to have it. What, I shouldn't have food in my pantry? Are you, are you kidding me? Of course I should have. Why shouldn't I have? <laughs> so are you, are you thrilled by it? No, it should be there, right? There you go. It's no longer joy. You have plumbing in your house. Do you understand what plumbing is to somebody that lived, whatever? You have, in, an, in, we're, we're learning online. You understand how mind blowing that is? It's, it's unfathomable. We take it for granted. It's an expectation. Oh, when pandemic hit and everyone discovered Zoom, everyone's elated. And now, yeah, of course it works. Yeah. What else is it going to do? I pay, what do you mean? I pay a monthly fee for this thing. Of course it should work. I mean, you don't have to. Only if you host. I pay a monthly fee, right? Um, it, expectations. Expectations are the kryptonite to happiness. It's the kryptonite. And so what I'd suggest, what, I, what I'm suggesting today is don't take your expectations for granted. The fact that you, that the ground underneath you was solid, the fact that the road underneath your car was safe, the fact that you got from point A to point B safely, every single time should never be considered, should never be taken for granted. It should always be experienced as a blessing from Hashem. Thank God. The Jewish people were traveling. 
and unbeknownst to them, a grave danger lurked. God took out the danger. And you know what? At the time, they had no idea. It was later that God said, by the way, look what I did for you guys. Look what I did for you guys. Just to let you know, FYI, we, God does that for us also. Once in a while, we get these little winks. God's like, by the way, that, that was me. Like, what? That was you? That's awesome, right? We have these moments, these, these wrinkles in our life where the you know, glitches in the matrix, we're like, whoa, that was pretty cool. That's God. And God's like, by the way, all that was me also. All that was me also. <laughs> like, you saw it there, but honestly, all that was also me. Like, that breath that you just took, yeah, that's me. Because your soul is not you. That's, I mean, it is you, but you didn't make that. <laughs> Trust me. You, you, I didn't, you and I didn't, we, we don't make our own life. So that breath, this breath, this life, it's not ours. It's a gift. You know, if we really live Jewishly, we would be the happiest people. It'd be pretty amazing. We should, and we should be happy. The inordinate amount of blessings that every single person has is just, can I speak of every single person? No, but most people, at least in Western societies, the, the inordinate amount of blessings that we have is just staggering, absolutely staggering. You would give a, a like a one one thousandth of what we have today to anyone who lived a thousand years ago, and they would be just absolutely their, their minds would be blown and their life would be the most amazing thing ever and us you know the garbage they didn't pick up from my street they 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 picked up from my neighborhood and they missed my street and now i have garbage sitting outside in my in my bin my life is ruined by the way that didn't happen with me right i mean it's happened before but you know that's 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 how people react that's how we react because we lose the plot. It's like we become so fixated on expectations that if, of course, what do you mean? I pay a, a waste management fee or whatever it is. I pay the city. I pay a few hundred bucks a year. They have to pick up every week. That's my, it's my expectation. And if they don't, whoo, I am so upset. Unbelievable. Ruin my plans. Really? Really? Because if you went a thousand years ago and say somebody else is going to pick up your garbage in a truck, you put in a green thing and, and there's no disease around because, you know, everyone's like everyone got figured out, like how diseases work. And we're able to bag things in plastic and destroy the environment at the same time. So, uh, sorry. And they're able to bag things in plastic and then put it into things and it gets dumped into landfills and creates other problems, whatever it is. But that that's a possibility. A person a thousand years ago would say, wow, you are living better than the than the than the most lavish kings. A thousand years ago. And then if they're late one week, oh, there's letters happening. There's Congress people involved, neighborhood associations. We're very upset. The miracles are all around us. The miracle at Arnon, today's reading, miracle at Arnon, could easily never have made the books, could have easily never made the Torah, except for one thing, that God opened the mountain and God let the blood flow and allowed the Jewish people to see the blood and to recognize that, oh, look at that. Something happened. How many times does God not show his hand? That doesn't make it less of a miracle. It just means that we have to work harder. We have to work a little bit harder to perceive and to think on our own and to be grateful for the blessings. All right, back inside, back inside. Let's do this. All right, now we end this reading, we have one more reading, don't worry, we end this reading with a bit of a poetic, um, bit of a poetic uh, tribute over here from the heights. We read it before, I'll read it again, from the heights to the valley, in the field of Moab at the top of the peak that overlooks the wastelands, here we go. From the heights of the valley, Rashi says, for there Moses died and the well ceased. Look at that. Um, another interpretation, a well dug by out by princes when they encamped each tribe, when they encamped, each tribal chieftain took a staff and drew it toward his division in his camp. Oh, look at this. Look at this. The waters of the well were drawn after that mark and came in front of the camping place of each tribe. Unbelievable. Yaakov Gothard asked Wednesday night, did the well divide into 12 different streams? 
And I said, well, I know the, I know the C split into 12. Makes sense that the well would have divided into the different tribal encampments, but I was a little bit tentative. Rashi says clearly, clearly that every tribal leader took his staff and drew it toward his division and his camp. They, they kind of like made a mark, <laughs> made a bit of a, a channel for the water and every tribe got its own mini water supply. Very cool. The answer is yes, it did divide into 12 to the 12 tribes through the lawgiver, through Moses, who was called the lawgiver. As it says, for there, the portion of the lawgiver is concealed. That's where he passed away. But why is Moses not explicitly mentioned in the psalm? Because he was smitten through the well, right? He was smitten. So it's not, he was struck. He was punished ultimately through hitting the water, hitting the rock, which caused the water for the well. So it doesn't, it's not right to like make, mention his name in a praiseworthy way regarding the well. It's just a bit mixing, too, too many mixed emotions. And because Moses' name is not mentioned, the name of God is not mentioned, this can be compared to a king who was invited to a banquet. He said, if my friend is there, I will be there. But if not, I'm not going. Look at that. God says, if Moses is not there, I'm out. Don't put my name in there either. So it's all written euphemistically. Of course, they are mentioned, God and Moses, but it's all euphemistically. It's not explicitly stated. Okay, let's... Rabbi Ari. Yes. Why do the staffs have so much power? Early in Egypt, Moses yeah. threw the staff down, turned into a snake. Uh, we just read how uh, the staff was a healing uh, from, the, from, this, from the poison snake bites. Right. Uh, and here we're reading how the staffs, again staffs, yeah. uh, were used to, to dig uh, 12 different wells. Staff, staff, staff. Days. Yeah. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Yeah, it's, um, it's, a, uh, it, it's certainly a recurring thing says that the staff of Moses, maybe even Aaron also, they had inscribed the name of God on it. And these were somehow, I, I hesitate to use the word magical, but kind of magical, powerful staffs. I don't know about the staffs of all of the 12 tribes, but it sounds like, you know, if you're wandering in the desert 40 years, you probably have a walking stick. Sure. Not gonna lie, right. So, and, and somehow that was, it's interesting because it's never become a symbol in Judaism. I think your point, I'm, I'm, me getting the energy of your of your question, is like that's not it's not a Jewish symbol today. We don't have that as a ritual item or a symbolic thing. Like, what's the staff? Is it's a little bit foreign. Maybe we power. should. Maybe we should. Maybe we should. Yeah, I mean, I know um, I know synagogues sometimes have a large staff, but that's something else. That's just <laughs> anyway. So um, that's just extra help. Uh, yeah, it, it's, I, I don't have a good answer or a good response other than very interesting point that you're making. I think it's very interesting. Okay. Now let's take a look. Okay. Let's take a look at reading seven and fast forward and let's do this. This will take us to the end of the Torah portion of Chugas. The drama continues. Israel sent messengers to Sichon. The king of the Amorites. Wow. The Amorites were the guys that were trying to kill the Jewish people from the mountains. They got crushed. Well, that was obviously not the entire Amorite people. That was certain numbers of Amorites. So Israel sends messengers to Sichon, the king of the Amorites, saying, let me pass through your land. Um, as I mentioned earlier today, the Jewish people were approaching Israel from the eastern side. And so they came from the south, from under Israel, and they went east around Moab, and now they're coming up to the land of the Amorites. So they asked if we can go through. They asked, can we go through your land? Let me pass through your land. Once again, like they said to um, uh, the Edomites, Edom, we will not turn into fields or at vineyards nor drink well water. We're not going to eat your food or drink your water. We shall walk along the king's road, the highway, until we have passed through your territory. And as Rashi said before, that means that we're not going to steal food We'll buy food. We won't steal water. We're going to buy water. We're going to support the economy. We're not going to ruin anything. Can we go through? Let us go through. But Sichon did not permit Israel to pass through his territory. And Sichon gathered all his people and went out to the desert toward Israel. He arrived at Yatza, Yatz, and fought against Israel. Basically, not only did the Amorites, the Amori, not only did they, did they refuse passage, but they actually came and started a war against the Jewish people. 
Israel smite. And of course, if you're attacked, you got to fight back. Israel smote him with the sword and took possession of his land from Arnon. That was the aforementioned um, border stream city to Yabok, as far as the children of Ammon, for the border of the children of Ammon was strong. So they captured the entire land from Arnon to Yabok. Again, like we don't have a map, but it's clearly a, a decently sized area. Israel took all these cities and the Israelites dwelt in all the cities of the Amorites in Cheshbon and all its villages. Okay. They conquered all those lands. The, uh, the Amori, the Amorites, um, or the Amorites, as it were here, the Amorites provoked, they attacked, the Jews defended themselves, they won, and they captured all these cities and villages. For Cheshbon was the city of Sichon, king of the Amorites, that was the capital. And he had fought against the first king of Moab, taking all his land from his possession as far as Arnon. In other words, in the history of that region, there were various regional wars in which nations gathered land or, or, or um, assumed possession of territories based on victories in war. Concerning this, those who speak in parables, that's a euphemism for uh, the evil prophet Balaam, those who speak in parables say, come to Cheshbon. Sounds like a, um, sounds like a vacation, um, you know, like a, an advertisement. Uh, tourism department of Cheshbon. Come to Cheshbon, may be built and established as a city of Sichon. For fire went forth from Cheshbon, a flame from the city of Sichon. It consumed Ar of Moab, the masters of the high places of Arnon. Woe is to you, Moab. You are lost, people of Chemosh, or Kmosh. He, his sons, he has given over his refugees and his daughters into captivity to Sichon, king of the Amorites. Basically, the Amorites had conquered other nations, other, other lands, and uh, that's how they had amassed their land. Their kingdom is destroyed from Cheshbon. It has been removed from Dibon. We laid them, we laid them waste as far as Nofach, which is near Medva. And Israel settled in the land of the Amorites. All of that is how the Amorites built their land. But the bottom line is that the Jews, having been attacked by the Amorites, defended themselves and then conquered all that land, or at least a large part of that land. Okay, now let's go back to Rash. Let's see where we're up to. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, let's just continue. Moses sent men to spy out Yazer, and they captured its villages, striving out the Amorites who lived there. Then they turned and headed north toward Bashan. Oh, our favorite giant, our favorite biblical giant, Og, the jolly green giant, Og, the king of Bashan, came out toward them with all his people to wage war at Edre. So just understand, uh, I, I just want to clarify this. The Jewish people had no intention of fighting, waging war, or anything with any of these nations, with any of these kings. They had no intent of any such skirmishes, battles, wars, or other, other types of uh, confrontation. They simply wanted to do one of two things, either pass through the land or go around the land. So they offered these places. Can we pass? They asked, can we pass through your land? Um, a few of the nations prior, um, Edom and Moab, they said, no, you can't. And the Jews went around. Well, Sichon says, no, you can't. And now we're fighting with you. And Bashan, led by Og. Right? Sichon, sorry, Sichon was the king of the Amorites. Sichon, Sichon, the king of the Amorites, said, no, you can't go through and we're going to fight. Og, king of Bashan, says, no, you can't go through and we're going to fight. These nations actually started the fights, the battles, waging war against the Jewish people. And thus, the Jews had to defend themselves. The Lord said to Moses, right, again, Og, came out toward them with all his people to wage war. He started fighting with them at a place called Adre. The Lord said to Moses, do not fear him. Altira Isa, do not fear him. I'm going to explain why he says that. Don't fear Og, the giant, for I have delivered him, his people, and his land into your hand. You shall do to him as you did moments ago, as we read, to Sichon, king of the Amorites, who dwells in Cheshbon. They smote him, his sons, and all his people until there was no survivor, they took possession of his land, um, and I'm going to add the words as well. So what we see here is the Jews went around the nations that didn't allow passage and then fought against the nations that waged war against them, namely um, Amori, the Amorites and the Bashanites, Bash, Amori uh, um, and Bashan. Those, um, those nations fought, the Jews fought back, and they won, and they actually conquered both of those lands. 
the land of the Amorites and the land of Bashan. Okay. And we'll finish off the Torah portion and then we're going to go back to Rashi's and, and a few lessons that I want to share with you. The children of Israel journeyed and encamped in the plains of Moab across the Jordan from Jericho. By the way, this is it. That was it. It's the final journey. They, set, they, they journeyed and they encamped in the plains of Moab right across the Jordan River from Jericho. That's where they would enter the land. Ultimately, they crossed the Jordan and went into Jericho under Joshua's leadership. So they are in, that's it. They're in the final, final position right there. Of course, the Torah is not over yet. And Moses doesn't die in the next scene. There's more drama that happens. The attempted curses, as we'll read next week, the attempted curses of Balaam, the evil prophet. There's the whole book of Deuteronomy, which uh, is Moses' final speech uh, spanning 40 days. His final words to the, I'm um, sorry, 37 days, his final words to the Jewish people at that place. But it all happened in the plains of Moab. That's where the final act of the Torah takes place. That's where the final act of the life of Moses and his uh, leadership of the Jewish people, that's where all that takes place. All right, let's go back and do some Rashi's and we'll close it out. We'll do, we'll do this a little bit quickly um, because we are at the time right now. Um, Okay, here we go. Israel sent messengers to Sichon. Elsewhere, the sending of the messengers is ascribed to Moses, as it says, what he says about himself in Deuteronomy when he was recounting. So I sent messengers from the desert of Kedemot. Similarly, Moses sent messengers to the king of Edom, but concerning Yiftach, it says Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom. So who was it? Was it Israel who sent the messengers or Moses? Listen to what Rashi says. These verses supplement each other. One holds back information by not informing us who authorized the sending of the messengers. And the other reveals that Moses sent them. Moses is Israel, and Israel is Moses to teach you that the leader of the generation is equal to the entire generation. Look at that. He says that Moses and the people are synonymous. Yes, sometimes it says that the people sent messengers, and it says that Moses sent messengers because a true leader is inseparable from the people, and a true people is inseparable from its leader. You cannot pull out Moses from the people, you cannot separate. You cannot sunder apart the people from Moses. They are inextricably intertwined. They are enmeshed together. Their destinies, their fates are intertwined. And so when Moses sends, the people send. When the people send, Moses send. It's the same thing. Kianasi, hu hako, because the leader is everything. In our Chabad parlance, the Rebbe, right? A Rebbe is, is, dedicated is one with the people and the people are one with the Rebbe. There's no separation between the two. Kianasi, who Hakol, the leader, is everything. Let's continue. They asked, Sichon, let me pass through your land, even though they were not commanded to offer them peace. They nevertheless sought, sought peace from them. They wanted to do this peacefully, but Sichon did not permit. Why not? Rashi explains. Since all the Canaanite kings paid him tribute for protecting them against marauding armies. In other words, he, Sichon and the Amorites, they were the land that was the buffer. Before you get to the land of Canaan, the land of Israel, they were right outside that land. They were a buffer to, and they were paid by the, the, the Canaanite kings to protect them against marauding armies. So when Israel said to him, let me pass through your land, he said to them, my very presence is only to protect them from you. So how can you even such, suggest such a thing? It's like, how can I let you go through my land into Canaan, the Canaanites pay me to stop anyone from coming through my land. So, in fact, let's go to war. Well, okay. Um, had Cheshbon been full of gnats, no creature could have conquered it. And had Sichon been living in a weak village, no man could have conquered it. It's unbelievable. How much more so was it invincible since he, uh, Sichon was in Cheshbon? No, Cheshbon was a lockdown city, not even a gnat. Could be could escape or be or be captured. Um, Sichon was a very strong leader. Cheshbon was the city or the land. Sichon was the king. The king that was powerful lived in the land or that city that was powerful. So how was it possible for the Jews to conquer the Holy One? Blessed be He said, "Why should I trouble my children to besiege every city?" He gave them. He sorry. He gave all the warriors the idea to leave the cities, and they all gathered in one place where they were slain. From there, Israel proceeded to the cities where there was no opposition since only women and children were left there. Basically, for some reason, they decided to have a general's conference in another part of town, and then Israel and then the Jewish people just wiped, that, wiped them out, and then everything else fell. 
Um, let's continue. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah, why is it necessary? So, so the Torah gets into whose land was it? It was originally Moabite land, and then it became the Amorite land, and then the Jews got it from the Amorites. So what's, why is that all important? Why was it necessary to write this, Rashi asked? For it says, do not distress the Moabites. And Cheshbon belonged originally to Moab, so scripture writes that Sichon had already taken away from them, and through him it was made permissible to Israel. In other words, although the, the, the land of, of Heshbon originally was Moabite land, and the Jews were told not to enter, not to conquer, not to take any Moabite land, at this point in history, Sichon, the king of the Amorites, had already taken it from. They, were, they had fought against the king of Moab, and they took all his land. At this point, it's not Moabite land anymore. It's Amorite land that was originally Moabite land, but it's now permissible for the Jews to take, which they did. Um, concerning this war which Sichon waged against Moab, uh, those who speak in parables say that refers to Balaam, as I mentioned earlier, um, come to Cheshbon because Sichon could not conquer it, so he went and hired Balaam to curse it. Aha. Uh-huh. This is what Balak meant when he said to him, for I know that whoever you bless is blessed. Basically, the way that Sichon was able to capture Moab uh, or the land from, from the Moabite nation years earlier was through the curses of Balaam, which is why at the uh, next week's Torah portion, they once again hire Balaam to curse the Jewish people this time uh, to bring about their downfall, God forbid. Okay, let's continue. Woe is to you, Moab, meaning that they curse Moab, that it be delivered into his hand. Okay, I'm just going to fast forward a little bit. Moses sent men to spy out Yazer, the spies, or, um, yeah, Yazer, the spies captured it. They didn't just spy it out, they, they actually captured the land. They said, we shall not do like the first group. We have such confidence in the power of Moses' prayer that we are able to do battle. Look at that. Unlike the first group 40 years earlier, the first group of spies that went out and um, failed spectacularly in their mission, they came back and gave a negative report and the Jews wandered for the next 39 years, totaling 40 years. This group of spies did not have a weakness, did not have a lack of confidence, did not, not believe in God. They actually had so much confidence, they actually went and fought and they captured the land itself. Um, God says to Moses, now the Jews are confronting Og, the king of Bashan, and God says to Moses, do not fear him. Why was he afraid? Rashi. Moses was afraid to fight against him, against Og, the giant, lest the merit of Abraham advocate for him. Huh? Abraham would have prayed on behalf of Og. How so? As it says, the refugee came. This is when Lot, Abraham's nephew, was kidnapped. And there was a guy called the refugee who came and told Abraham, hey, your nephew's in danger. And then Abraham ref- rescues his, his nephew. Who was the refugee? Who was the reporter who came and told Abraham about his nephew's peril? This was Og, who had escaped from the Rephaim, who were smitten by Cherdala Omer and his allies at Asherah Karnaim. As it says, only Og, the king of Basham, was left of the remnant of the Rephaim. He was the refugee. Basically, long story short, Og had lived many centuries. Times of, uh, of Abraham were, were upwards of 400 years prior. This is four centuries prior. Og was not only very large, he was also very old. But Og had one thing up his sleeve. He had spiritual merit. He had a mitzvah. What mitzvah? Saving a life. By the way, the mitzvah of saving a life is a very big mitzvah. You save a life, it's like you say, it's like you save the entire world. So saving a life is a very big deal. Og saved the life of Lot, Abraham's nephew. When Lot was endangered, was in danger, he went to his uncle, he went to Lot's uncle Abraham, Avram, and he told him, and Avram rescued his nephew. And happily ever after did they all live. And Og had that merit. So Moses, that now that he has to fight 400 years later, Moses is now fighting Og. And Moses says to himself, this guy saved Lot. He hooked up Abraham. Abraham's going to pray for him. What's going to happen with us? At least Abraham's going to have conflict. I mean, this guy helped my family, but he's uh, you know, trying to fight against my, grand, my great-great-grandchildren. A little bit of conflict of interest. So Moses was afraid. God said, there's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to fear. All is good. They smote him. 
Rashi explains, Moses slew him, Og the giant. As it says in Brachot, in the Talmud, he uprooted a mountain of three parasangs, intended, intending to throw it at, at it. oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay, basically, I'm going to tell you what happened here. Story goes that Og picked up a tree, intending it, intending to throw it at the Jewish people because he was a giant. Okay, but meanwhile, as he's lifting it up, somehow it falls on his on his own head, and it actually, um, here, here, I'm going to show you the Gemara, the Talmud. Here, I, I just pulled it up. Let's read it together. Okay, this is going to be the Talmud of all Talmudic pieces. Be a lot of fun. With regard to the rock that O King Gabashan sought to throw upon Israel, there's no biblical reference, but rather tradition was transmitted. The Talmud relates that Og said, how large is the camp of Israel? It is three parasangs. I will go and uproot a mountain, three parasangs long. Oh, a mountain, not, not a tree. I don't know why I said tree, a mountain, like a big stone, stone mountain. And I will hurl it upon them and kill them. He went, uprooted a mountain, three parasangs long, and brought it on his head. Or he lifted up over his head. And the Holy One, blessed be he, brought grasshoppers upon it, and they pierced the peak of the mountain, and it fell on his neck. Look at that. Basically, termites. Okay, I know it's not wooden termites, but I'm just thinking termites. Imagine your whole right, piece of wood, and then termites, and then it falls or whatever, whoosh, and it just surrounded his head. So he was holding this rock, this mountainous rock, or rocky mountain, like cores, and, 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 and it like somehow it's, it's hollowed out a little bit, and then it falls on his head, falls on his neck. Og wanted to remove it from his head. You can imagine, he wanted to probably take this mountain off his head. His teeth were extended to one side of his head and to the other, and he was unable to remove it. You know, like when something goes over and then you can't get it out? You know, like it's like, oh, my teeth. This is awkward. That's what's written. You break the teeth of the wicked. Oh, from Psalms, like literally. And this is in accordance with the homiletic interpretation of Rish Lakish. As he said, what is the meaning of that which is written? You break the teeth of the wicked. Do not read as you break, but rather as you lengthened. Ah, you lengthened the teeth. The teeth became really big. He couldn't get it off. <laughs> Probably also broke his teeth, but he couldn't get it off his, uh, his head. The story concludes, how tall was Moses? He was 10 cubits tall. He took an axe 10 cubits tall, jumped up 10 cubits and struck Og in the ankle and killed him. Basically, Og now has a rock against his neck, uh, over his head and Mo he becomes vulnerable and Moses then strikes him in the ankle and knocks him down and then kills him eventually. Um, one must recite a blessing when he sees the rock upon which Moses sat. Oh, that's another story. Okay, so that's it. That's what we got over here. Okay, so yeah, it makes sense. Sure. Let me let me add one more wrinkle to this because, and to me, this is this is the most I can see the most important, but this is a really important point. Why did Og? Right, Moses was afraid of Og. Og had this tremendous merit. Og saved Lot's life. He saved. Lot. Why? Why was Og running to Abraham to tell him about Lot in the first place? You know why? Because he wanted Og to get involved in a war and die in battle. Why? Because he wanted, Og wanted to marry Avram's wife, Sarah, who was, the Talmud says, one of the most beautiful women that had ever existed. As we know, when they went down to Egypt, Pharaoh took her as a wife. Avi Melech, the king of Plishim, took, him as, took her as a wife. She was stunningly beautiful. And Og had his eyes, very large eyes. Hey, he was a giant. He had his very large eyes on Sarah. But I guess he respected the institution of marriage. He did not respect the institution of life, but he, in, in, but he respected the institution of marriage. He decides, how is he going to get Avram dead? How can he make sure that Sarah is a widow? No, he did not read true crime novels and other sorts of reports. He didn't poison Abraham. He rather told him at the first opportunity, oh, by the way, your nephew was captured and is now in this war. And he thought, Abraham's going to go try to rescue him. And the rescue mission, ugh, Abraham would be taken out. Sarah would be the grieving widow. Og would, 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 would deftly saunter in, boom, boom, <laughs> boom, <laughs> glide into the scene, right? Very, uh, very suave, giant-like slide into the scene, whisk Sarah off her feet, quite literally, and happily ever after, Og and Sarah Imenu. Well, didn't happen. Because Abraham was successful, 
and he was victorious in the war. He saved his nephew, and that's what happened, which then calls into question everything we just read. 400 years later, Moses is afraid that Og's merit of rescuing Lo would be would stand in his good stead. Merit? He wanted to kill Abraham. Here lies the big message, and that is when you do a mitzvah, even if you do it for the wrong reasons, it's still a merit. Even Og, who had the worst of intentions, he wanted Abraham dead. He wanted to marry Sarah. Can you imagine the horror? Gross on so many levels. And yet, the fact that he saved, that he was part of saving, rescuing, saving Lot's life, you save a life, you save an entire world. Does the fact, the fact that you had, not you, the fact that he had this devious intention, yes, it's relevant on some level, but on another level, it's still a mitzvah, it's still a merit, and Moses was still afraid that it might stand him a good stand. And God had to tell him, don't worry, I, I will make sure that you're protected, I'll make sure that you're going to be victorious, don't worry. But there was what to worry about. The moral of the story is, and we'll, we'll end off the Torah portion, uh, we'll end chukas with this message, and that is, Never hold back from a mitzvah because you think it's maybe not coming from the purest of places. Well, I mean, I should clarify. Don't, don't go og. Like that's, don't go og and don't go rogue. Those are two things not to go. But sometimes we think to ourselves, well, I can't do it purely. I'm not a tzaddik. I'm not this, I'm not that. Don't worry. Get the job done. Do the mitzvah. Take it easy. It's still a merit. Even og had a merit. And he had horrible intentions. We don't have such horrible intentions. Sometimes it's just not 100% pure. Okay, that's also fine. Do the right thing, get it done, and bring Mashiach. All right, great to see you all this week. It's getting a little bit late. I know, sorry for holding everybody uh, this late on Arab Shabbat. I want to wish you guys a wonderful Shabbat. This week, of course, is the Solish Tribute Shabbat. I don't know if that's the right term for it. Uh, but um, so looking forward to seeing those of you that can make it to Shul and Shul on Shabbat. Tomorrow morning, starting at 10, Kiddush following services, and they're looking forward to celebrate and to connect. Are you doing the learner service too? No learner service because okay. of the special. Right. We need to do it right. next week. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. Sandrine and Ray and Faye and Mark. Shabbat Shalom. Good Shabbos. Yashikoa. All right. Lots of love for good Shabbos, everybody. Did you, you get your special email this morning? Did you see? Um, I'm going to make sure it didn't go in your junk. <laughs> From Kudo. I need to check. I need to check. Yeah. I will, I will check on that. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah, I'll, let you, I'll let you know. Shabbat. Okay. Awesome. And your Perfect. WhatsApp too. Okay. All right. I'll check it out. Shabbos. Shabbos, everybody. Shabbos. Take care, everybody. Shabbos.